Okay, so our next speaker coming from Germany, a long flight, Patrick Ruther. Uh, Patrick is a senior scientist uh, in the Department of Microsystems Engineering at the University of, of Freiburg. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Freiburg would be in Switzerland. <laughs> Freiburg, oh, Freiburg, but <laughs> uh, people find us uh, in, in any case. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Also, thanks for the invitation. Uh, being here the second time at the ICANN conference, it's always a big pleasure being here. And for me, it's the third time being in Michigan. I remember 12 years ago, I had my first meeting here. Uh, great time. Yeah, today I would like to depart a bit from the usage of LED-based MEMS tools, not in the cortex or the uh, cere cerebral tissue, but rather going a bit away from that. And uh, one aspect here, and then we have seen multiple of these uh, uh, devices yesterday here from, from Michigan, fantastic tools. And uh, if you, if you, or when you look at, at these systems, you, you see that uh, all of them are somehow application-specific uh, designed and, and of course here in this case we would like to make them very small so that the tissue um, damage is, is reduced. On the other hand if we place them onto the cortex we might make them a bit bigger. Question of, of course is how do we tailor here the, the assembly of the devices but that's all yeah, driven by the application. Now our question was can we use these devices for different uh, task for different uh, applications and that's exactly what I would like to address today. First of all I will describe the technological opportunities that we have. In our case we use micro LEDs that are integrated on flexible substrates that sometimes we stiffen them again and we use also thin film LEDs uh, that's an innovative uh, process that we developed and here in this case we optimized this process in view of the thermomechanical behavior of these devices. And the application by itself is we would like to use these probes as an optical cochlear implant doing optogenetics in the cochlea itself. We might use it to uh, stimulate skeletal muscles, but I will skip that today. But we can use that as well for pacing and defibrillation of the heart uh, itself. And finally, yes, I will, will conclude. Now, these are the devices we are working on. Uh, these are the micro LED chips that are integrated into a, a flexible substrate. I will briefly explain the fabrication process, but we might also stiffen them. And uh, Elisabeth Otte has, a, uh, has a, a poster here. She can explain more details of that device. And then we have the thin film LEDs on a flexible substrate. And also Eric Klein will explain more details on how this is fabricated. I will only briefly touch that. And here down there, that's a very simple device where we use SMD uh, components that are just uh, put into a small tube filled with silicone to encapsulate these systems. Okay, coming to the first potential application of our flexible systems. This is the so-called uh, optical cochlear implant substrate. So we have a long uh, polyimide shank that carries 10 uh, micro LEDs. They might be equipped in addition with a platinum meander used for temperature measurements. And then for simplicity, we simply use an interface that goes into a zero insertion force connector, making a fast connection for our acute experiments that uh, were done with these systems. The fabrication process is straightforward. So we used the polyimide process that Thomas Stieglitz introduced in, in Freiburg. We modified it a bit by electroplating here uh, the metal tracks to reduce the, the line resistance to operate our devices at reasonable voltages. And we also include electroplating of the contact pads so that the assembly of our uh, LEDs is easily done using the flip chip bonding process as briefly sketched here. So we start with our polyimide substrate, the electroplated pads. We do the flip chip bonding, a plasma treatment, and we have to underfill the gap between the LED and the substrate to isolate the contact pads, then another plasma treatment, and then the entire probe is encapsulated into polymers. Most of the time we simply use silicone. And just one example that uh, shows you the importance of which material is used at the end to fill the gap between here, the, between the LED and the substrate. This is one example where we use an epoxide and here in comparison cytop, that's a fluor polymer that shrinks a lot and we see all these voids around that these are all open uh, access ports for any liquid um, the, the, the probe is then exposed to. 
yeah, this is how the device looks like, a bit more in detail or a bit enlarged. So here you see these commercial uh, LED chips from, from Tree uh, emitting at 460 nanometers. We can make them highly uh, flexible and that's illustrated here, hopefully, yeah, with our probe in uh, a dummy cochlear bending the probe by a radius of 500 uh, micrometers and it's still functional. And clearly we can make it as a slender probe, but we can also do that as a 2D array here. This one could in principle be placed on, on the brain surface, but it might also be positioned on the heart itself. Now testing, as we have heard yesterday, is an important aspect. And one thing that uh, Michael Schmerzler is doing in my team, he tests the probes in a salt solution at a defined uh, temperature and then he checks for all what, what is needed in particular he checks for the temperature of our devices and what Michael did is he started uh, measuring uh, let's say the heat with the platinum meander under the, the LED at certain uh, current levels for certain pulse length and what we now see here in that view graph is the extraction using a model yeah, and then predicting what is the temperature rise uh, and uh, then the decline of the temperature when we use, for instance, here in this case, five millisecond long pulses at certain current levels. And these are fairly high. You see here almost 40 milliamps are used. We power them at the limit that is, that is doable. Now, what we clearly see is that uh, dependent on the pulse duration, we get a temperature increase of 40 degrees. This is, of course, nothing that you would like to have in, in the body itself, but here in this case, it's the temperature just under the LED. So what we had to do is we had to simulate the entire system. So this shows an explosion view of what we did. This is the LED. This is the metal tracks that we have. These are the bond pads and the encapsulation of the entire probe. And then looking at uh, the temperature uh, over the, the device as a function of the different materials and their respective properties. Now, coming back to the, this uh, measurement and then putting a simulation over it, I didn't believe that at the, at the beginning because they, they perfectly match. Obviously, we have the right set of parameters. Now, if you play around with that a bit, you, you shift here by plus minus five degrees. But I would say this is, this is fair enough and good enough for let's, having a look at the temperature uh, development in the probe itself. And when we take a completely encapsulated probe and we look at the temperature at the top and at the bottom, still we see these huge temperature increases if we work with 10 milliseconds at a huge uh, electrical power of 135 milliwatts. So this is for sure nothing that, that we uh, in, in, uh, in general use in the, in the experiment, but it tells us what is the temperature evolution. And also we looked at, let's say, different... Um, scenarios in particular what if we would accept one kilo uh, one kelvin of temperature increase for a four millisecond long pulse we clearly see that this this increase is reached 51 microns above the probe and in between the temperature increase is, is higher yeah? and the same uh, what we see here for 10 millisecond long pulses here we have to go 100 microns away from our probe to reach this one kelvin limit so this is something to be taken into account but Please keep in mind 135 milliwatts that are applied. We can operate also down here. So this is just for the safety limits. The other question is, when do these probes fail? Yeah, and unfortunately, I cannot tell you they fail always after two weeks or later. No, that, that's at the moment not predictable. But what we see here is, let's say, a typical test scenario where we operate the LEDs with 30 milliamps, again, a high uh, power, electrical power that we provide, four millisecond long pulses, 10% duty cycle, and we do uh, 1,000 pulses, which means 1,000 times heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down, so a mechanical stress in the, in the device itself. And once this is done, we make a leakage measurement, reverse biasing the LED and checking for the leakage current. And the probe uh, fails when the leakage current exceeds one microamp, but we, of course, tested it up to one milliamp of leakage current to see corrosion in the devices. And what we see here when we look at the leakage current as a function of, of time, we see a sudden and abrupt uh, uh, failure of the probe itself. And when, when we zoom in into this area, we see there is a certain decline and even reaching our 
leakage current limits, we still have the LEDs, so this is the, the, these blue spots, we have the LEDs still operating, although leak, the leakage current is achieved or is reached. Now what uh, Michael did with a couple of yeah, tests uh, looking at different coatings, and I must say in our case, our ALD, aluminum oxide is not as good as, as yours are using, so our probes here failed with that purely ALD encapsulation, but when we take Epotec as number fill and silicone, um, encapsulating the entire probe, we could operate it here, in this case, it was 20 day, uh, no, 10 days at 30 milliamps, and this probe survived additional 43 days. So I would say under these harsh conditions, that's more than enough for animal experiments. And so that's the reason why, why we use these devices now also in cochlear implant tests. Now, the second type of probe is something where we do our own thin film LEDs a bit uh, different from uh, what you do here in, in Michigan. In our case, we do a wafer level transfer. So we take thin film LEDs and transfer them onto a substrate. The example that you see here is a probe that contains 144 micro LEDs aligned along this 1.5 centimeter long probe shank. We operate them in a multiplexing fashion by 12 plus 12 uh, contact pads. And we have two flavors of this probe. One probe is here, uh, comprises a polyimide substrate and uh, epoxide on top, encapsulating the LEDs and the metal tracks uh, uh, contacting this device. And then we have the completely epoxide-based probe where uh, we can show, and I, I show you the pictures, where we can improve the thermomechanical behavior of the device itself. Now, the fabrication process is sketched here, and Eric poster 18 can explain all the details uh, on the fabrication process itself, but what he has to do is he has to first pattern the LED substrate, which means gallium nitride on a sapphire wafer, applying all the metal lines and the bond metallization. In our case, it's indium. Then we have the polymer substrate, which means in our case, patterning uh, uh, polyimide or epoxide uh, and depositing uh, metallization and last but not least the laser transfer process where we bond the LEDs or the, 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 the LED wafer onto our polymer substrate as shown here we do then an underfill to mechanically secure everything the uh, sapphire is then lifted here in this case uh, in this uh, panel by, by laser lift off we do the metallization on top and insulation and we pattern the entire probe so that we can lift that off now, the optimization that had to be done in particular for the purely epoxy probe um, included things like uh, just taking care of the handle wafers. You get the gallium nitride on sapphire, so we also use sapphire for the poly polymer substrates to minimize the mechanical stress during uh, the thermomechanical stress through, uh, during bonding. We had to look at yeah, pinning structures so that we can fix. Um, the substrates on our probe, uh, on our wafer, but also we had to take care of how to release these devices. Um, yeah, and last but not least, this was a bit uh, tricky and uh, Eric invested a lot of time in that, is how can we spin coat a two component epoxide, not separating the components. So a couple of tricks and uh, looking at uh, etch rates as a function of spinning speed. Now as a result, we obtain probes that are mechanically robust. So what we did here is we did a, a bending test of roughly one million bending cycles and the probe by itself didn't fail. Uh, more important for us is the thermomechanical behavior because during the encapsulation, we have to expose the, the probe to temperatures around 100 degrees. And what you see here is the polyimide probe bends as you increase the temperature. So it bends up and when we cool down, it relaxes, but we obtain a hysteresis here. And that's, let's say, a bend by roughly 90 degrees. In contrast, the purely epoxy probe um, shown, shown here stays more or less straight. Little thermomechanical, uh, um, uh, thermomechanical stress in the probe itself. Now, this is how the probe looks like. We can easily wrap it around a rod with a diameter of uh, one millimeter. We can operate the LEDs and we can also encapsulate 
um, uh, the entire probe in silicone. So what you see here in dark is the substrate, are the polyimide and epoxy, or purely epoxy. And Eric developed a mold-based process that allows us not only to coat the, the back and front side of the probe, but also the sides here, which is most critical in view of application. Okay, now, where do we want to apply these devices? As said, it's a cochlear implant, it's for cardiac pacing and defibrillation, and we might use these devices, and then the tests started in this direction, to open the vocal cords by electrical stimulation. That doesn't work because you have competing muscles. If you stimulate, the one is opening, the other one is closing, so it won't work. And let's say the optogenetic stimulation could work here, but I skip uh, these probes to, um, for, the, for the sake of time. Now, uh, cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are the most successful uh, electro-stimulating prosthesis. You see that uh, electrodes are inserted into the cochlea, and you, use, you do a stimulation with 12 to 18 uh, sites. But due to the fact that the electrical current spreads inside the cochlea, you lose frequency resolution. And uh, for people carrying cochlear implants, it, it might be okay to follow a conversation, but it might not be doable at the bar or uh, uh, nor, let's say, uh, enjoying music. And uh, one idea, and this came up from Tobias Moser in Göttingen, is why not using optogenetics and having small LEDs implanted into the cochlear that allow us to have a very localized stimulation of the uh, spiral ganglion neurons. This was the, the basic idea, and we were asked whether we can make uh, probes like that. The requirements, and that was at the beginning a bit tricky, we started with mice, a small cochlea, so we hope that we get the bigger one. So nowadays, um, uh, we, well, I, I will show the picture later. Uh, we work with, with large animals, um, but uh, typical numbers are here. 300 microns uh, diameter of the probe when it is encapsulated. We need bending radii around 500 microns. Power densities, as we know it from optogenetics, 4 milliwatts per millimeter squared, and as channel Robertson two is, uh, is used, a wavelength around 470 nanometers. Now using the probe that Michael did, meaning micro LED chips on a flexible substrate, as, as shown here, we implanted, or better to say our colleagues in, T uh, in Göttingen, implanted these probes through the round window into the cochlear. And what you see here with this MR image, you see how the, the probe winds inside the cochlear can see the, the contact pads where, where the LEDs are. And we stimulated um, the cochlear with uh, pulses or with light pulses from these implanted LEDs. Now, just a few um, comments on, on these pictures that, that you see here. So this is, first of all, the uh, auditory brainstem res response when you provide a click sound. This is the response when you stimulate the cochlea with a laser, meaning a, an optical fiber that provides light into the cochlea. And this is then the optically evoked um, auditory brainstem response with the LED. So it's functional. We obtain um, these brainstem responses. Um, it's fairly specific. So this is the animal with the LED in, stimulating, then pulling out the LED a bit so that uh, uh, the light is not shining into the cochlea. Clearly, there is no response. And after sacrificing the animal, still the LED array in the cochlea, we only see the uh, stimulation artifacts, the electrical artifacts of the device. And then, as well, we can, let's say, have the system running in different depths. And we are currently checking for the frequency resolution with these devices. Now, more experiments have been done by for instance, implanting uh, different um, optical cochlear implant implants into one rat and see how stable the stimulation might be. So looking at the, the peak amplitude here um, of the uh, OABR, uh, we looked at uh, the influence of the stimulation duration of the optical power and the stimulation rate, and we could stimulate up to 200 hertz. And then here in this column, 
we, we do, um, uh, we use one implant and th that is used in four different rats, showing that the system by itself is stable enough. And here we compare, in addition, the, the influence of, or the, the effect of the micro-LED with a laser combined with a fiber. So the starting point of the experiments that the group of Tobias and Mosel did. So it's functional. Um, the second good news here is that also those thin film LED uh, probes of Eric are functional. So just uh, in, in this panel we see that when we implant the probe that in this case contained only 16 LEDs, we could again evoke brainstem responses and we could also then discriminate between two LEDs and of course if you then stimulate both uh, LEDs you obtain a larger response. So in that sense we are quite sure that things can be done with these LEDs but we have to work on the long-term stability to make these, these probes more stable. Yeah, that brings me to the second application and that's the, the, the application on the heart or in the heart. As you know the pacemaker is, is a very powerful system that is used to you know, pace uh, the heart but uh, on the other hand we have these implantable defibrillators that are used for <coughs> ventricular arrhythmias that are the most uh, yeah, severe complications of the heart which might cause sudden cardiac death. The problem with these defibrillators is that they have severe side effects. They might cause structural damage of the cardiac tissue, they for sure uh, generate severe pain to the patients and or possibly psychological trauma and they might increase mortality. And so the question or one of the questions is can we use optogenetics doing a stimulus? Maybe not needed for pacemaking but for defibrillation that might be the solution because you can have a cell type specific stimulation of cardiac cells. Now one of our partners in Bonn, it's Professor uh, Philip Sasse, he's working on, on that topic, uh, introducing channel rhodopsin into cardiac muscle cells and he could show that he can uh, pace the heart with optical stimuli. Moreover, we see that the ECG signals of a yeah, normal beating heart are very comparable to those when you do a stimulation in the right atrium. So that can be done with, the, uh, with an optical stimulation and particularly in this case he did the stimulation through a, a microscope looking onto the heart and that, that was doable. Now in our case we tried to use our LEDs on a flexible substrate. You have seen the 2D arrays so we placed it directly onto the heart and we have a Langendorf perfused heart freely beating them in a solution and then it's not clearly seen but the, yeah, the, the heart is beating and at least with the ECG signals we can clearly show okay a pacing can be done with uh, a, a single LED positioned on the heart itself. Now the other question of course is what if we have a fibrillation? What if the heart by itself goes out of rhythm and again data from uh, Philip Sasse and Tobias Brugmann indicating that stimulating the heart or bringing the, the heart into fibrillation, having here fibrillation, you could stop, you can ter terminate that with an optical defibrillation providing a longer light pulse. Now what uh, uh, Tobias Brugmann and, and Philip Sasse analyzed is the question how long do we, do we need to make the pulse duration, what about the area that needs to be illum illuminated and what about the light intensity and the good or not so good news for us making MEMS devices is that at least the area is fairly large that you need to stimulate. A large area that, that needs to be covered by the yeah, LEDs that, uh, that we provide. Now I cannot uh, show you uh, pictures of the device uh, but we did a system that somehow looks like, like that, very schematic here, where we have multiple LEDs that we can more or less place around or fix around the heart and we would like to see how many of those uh, LEDs with a size of 200 by 200 micrometers are needed to um, obtain a defibrillation of the heart itself. So this is from the outside but we also tested uh, with uh, Peter Cole in, in uh, Freiburg uh, and Callum Johnston, what happens if we implant the LEDs into 
um, the heart itself. Um, for that, we used our stiffened uh, probes, and as I said, Elisabeth Otte can explain more on the, on the fabrication technology. The specific aspect here is that the Suleiman Ayyub, who, who did this, made a probe that can shine light either to the, to the front or to the back, so to see whether we have a directional uh, dependence. Uh, I can skip the fabrication process here, but only to say, yeah, dependent on where into the heart itself we implant the probe, we, we will see different, uh, different behaviors and, and uh, we, we have a site-specific reaction of the heart itself. Now, these two videos, and for all of you making silicon probes, they easy break, but obviously one can make them stable enough so you see the beating heart, Langendorf perfused, supported from the back, remove now this stiff nail into the probe, for sure nothing that is optimum, but we can go in, you see the, the, the silicon needle bending a bit, but it's doable, and, oops, and ultimately uh, we can also then do the stimulation in the heart itself, and depending on where we are, we see a localized optical stimulation, or spreading over the entire heart, but that's highly specific on the position where we do the stimulus. Just a few things that, uh, that we observed. The rear side il illumination is purely rear side, so all the light is going backwards. The front side illumination, there we have a bit of stray light to the back, and we have to see how strongly that will influence anything in, in, the, in, in the heart itself. Um, here we have a look at the typical radiant flux of the power that we obtain, microwatts, uh, then you have to relate, yeah, you have to relate that to um, the size of the, of the LED, and then here just uh, pictures uh, where we see, okay, wherever we are or dependent on where we are, we see uh, different light patterns in the heart itself, and we will also see that as a reaction of the heart itself. Now, in cooperation with Callum Johnston, we, we did a uh, pacing of the heart. In this case, we have um, the LED sitting in the front of a, of a ventricular free wall. Uh, in the second case, uh, we are pacing from the septum, and we could clearly see this is the pacing, so the heart follows our optical stimuli, and then we have the free beating of the heart itself. And the other point is when we apply a stimulus on the order of 12 hertz, we can cause fibrillation, which in this case, as it, as it is an intact, a healthy heart, we see a self-termination of this fibrillation after our stimulus. What uh, our colleagues also did, they did measurements of the voltage on the surface of the heart itself with voltage-sensitive dyes, and uh, what you see here at the top is just the, the naturally beating heart and here this rectangle indicates where we think the, uh, the LED has been in, in, the, in the heart muscle itself. And down there we have the same situation now with the uh, LED being operated. And uh, now when it's getting dark here, oops, now then the, the LED was on. So we, we are looking at um, the wave that is, that is uh, running around the heart itself. And this is exactly shown here, so how this propagates around the heart and depending on which LED is operated and depending on where this LED is positioned in the heart, we get slightly different uh, behavior in comparison to our control. Oops, okay, no, once again. That brings me to, to my conclusions. I hope I could show you that and MEMS-based optical tools can find different applications. Um, I think we could show you that thin film LEDs with our in-house process can be made flexible, but we also have examples where the LEDs are positioned on a stiff silicon substrate. Not as small as you see, uh, Jung does it with his team, but this is, is doable here as well. Then we have the, yeah, the poor man's uh, version using uh, commercial LED chips that are integrated on uh, polymer substrates or, if you like, even uh, SMD components, but I cannot recommend to solder them by hand. It's a, it's a nightmare. Um, as I said, we integrate them on flexible substrate that might be stiffened for penetration into tissue. 
We had a look at the long-term stability. Still, this is an issue where we have to work more and, and, and uh, prove that the probes are then long-term stable for uh, maybe a few months. Um, we have seen the thermal behavior as well as the thermal mechanical behavior. And as I uh, explained, we use them on cardiac tissue, but also as an optical cochlear implant. So a broader application, here we still have neurons and the other case we have muscle cells that are stimulated. Yeah, I would like to thank the funding agencies funding this research and also all those people that have been involved, uh, color coded for the different projects and the numbers tell you where they are from. And in that sense, I thank you for your attention and happy to answer your questions.